I'm Tim Vandergriff from Master Vintner. And if you're thinking about making your own wine, you're in good company. The idea of making wine at home is as old as the idea of home itself. People have been making wine for tens of thousands of years. In fact, winemaking is a natural process. If you did nothing more than put some grapes into a jar and leave them, the juice would run out, wild yeast would ferment it, and it would turn itself into wine. Now, it'd be a little rough and ready. So what we've put together is the equipment and the supplies for you to make not just wine, but great wine from the very first time. So a couple of things about winemaking. First, don't worry that you don't know anything to start with. Everybody starts someplace. Second, I said you could make not just good wine, but great wine. And that's the truth. You can make wines the equal of those from Stag's Leap Vineyard in Napa or Sonoma's Dry Creek Valley. And they'll turn out fantastic. The results are guaranteed. Now you get to decide which wine you want to make. Again, don't worry if you don't have a high level of wine knowledge. That doesn't preclude you from knowing your own taste. Do you want to make white Zinfandel to have with your chicken salad? Do you want a great big red to have with your steak? Or do you want just a nice wine for sipping with friends around the fire? Choose something that you like to drink. In the course of this video, we're going to show how it only takes a couple of hours of time altogether to make two and a half cases of wine. And I'll demonstrate the equipment and the ingredients that you'll be using. Once you've decided which wine to make, you're going to need your equipment. First, there's the Big Mouth Bubbler Plastic 6.5 Gallon Primary Fermenter. This is where the wine will go for the first part of the fermentation process. There's also a 6 gallon glass carboy where the wine will go to finish. There's also a bung and an airlock. These help keep air from entering the wine and oxidizing it. You'll also need some cleaning equipment, including cloths and some sanitizing products. We're going to be using one step no rinse sanitizer and some metabisulfite solution. We'll demonstrate how to use those in a bit. You're also going to need a plastic spoon, a bottle filler, we've also got five feet of tubing, an auto siphon, and that's going to help you transfer liquid from one of the fermenters to the other. We've got our clean bottle express wine and beer degasser. We'll be demonstrating that. It's very interesting. There's also a carboy brush and a bottle brush, which help keep everything clean. There's 30 corks and a corking machine. We've got a thermometer for checking the temperature of our grape juice. There's also some stick-on thermometers to make sure that our fermenters stay in the right temperature range. We're going to need a wine thief. This one comes in three pieces and needs to be assembled. That's used to take samples to check the wine. We're going to be using a hydrometer and test jar. That'll tell us the progress of our fermentation. We've also got some instructions and a DVD. Be sure to read those. The first step that you are going to take in winemaking is the most important one. You need to open the box and extract the single most important item that you're going to get. That is your instructions. Carefully remove the instructions from the box, take them out, put them back in the box, close it and do nothing else until you have completely and thoroughly read your instructions. Why so much emphasis in the instructions? Well, within them is everything you need to know to make a great wine. They've got information on temperature, timelines, specific gravity readings, and they're the place you can go back to to refer to find out where you are in your process. Keep in mind that wine kits are made in a winery, and they're very carefully crafted. They've got the right amount of nutrient, they've got the right specifications for sugar, for tannin, for acid, for alcohol, all those things. But to have them turn out, you need to follow the instructions, so please do. That brings us to an important point. If your instructions vary from anything you see in this video, obey the instructions. We've necessarily made this just a tiny bit generic because some kits contain oak, some kits contain sweetening packs, and some kits have different timelines. When in doubt, your instructions are the place to go. The first step in winemaking is to get everything clean and sanitized so we can use it. Cleaning and sanitizing are two separate steps. Cleaning is the removal of visible residue and stains from your equipment, and sanitizing is treating it with an inhibitor that'll prevent the growth of spoilage organisms and bacteria. 
For our first day, we're going to sanitize and clean our primary fermenter, our lid, spoon, thermometer, hydrometer, test jar, wine thief, bung, and airlock. We're going to use one step cleaner. It works great. A tablespoon in a gallon of warm water will clean very effectively. Please don't use any household cleaning products on your winemaking equipment. Almost all of them have high levels of industrial perfume, which can sink into your equipment and stay, effectively contaminating plastic and even leaving residue on glass. Once your equipment is clean, you can sanitize it. Most winemakers use metabisulfite. It's a solution made of three tablespoons of sulfite powder in one gallon of cool water. Stir to mix and it's ready to use. You can dip or soak each piece of equipment in it, and then you can either let it completely drip dry or rinse it with clean water. You could also put it into a trigger spray bottle and use it that way. Whichever way you choose to use it, don't inhale the vapor from the liquid sulfite solution. It's kind of nasty smelling. You don't want to breathe that in. Leftover sulfite solution doesn't need to be tossed out. You can keep it tightly sealed in a jar for up to a month at room temperature before you have to make a fresh batch. All right, now that all of our equipment is sanitized and ready to go, it's time to dive into the kit. The first step will be to have a look at the top of the box and see if there's a product code sticker on top. If there is, peel it off and stick it onto your instructions. This has not only the name of the kit and the type of wine it is, but also a product date code that will be very useful if you have any questions or inquiries about this particular kit. Next step, take everything out of the box and let's have a look at what our ingredients are. This bag contains all of the ingredients and additives that you need to make your wine. It includes a packet of yeast, specially chosen for this particular kit. It's also got bentonite, which is added to the wine on day one, partly to help us clarifying it and partly to help getting the fermentation going. It contains potassium sorbate and potassium metabisulfite in order to stabilize the wine in the bottle and a fining agent to make sure it clears up on time. Now, different kits have different additives as well. This particular kit we're making today contains some oak powder. This simulates aging in the barrel. Some kits have more than one package. If your kit has more than one package, add all of them when directed. Other kits may have another smaller bag of juice inside. That's a sweetening packet used after fermentation is over. Consult your instructions. The first step is to dissolve our bentonite in about a half a gallon of warm water in the bottom of our fermenter. This is pretty easy and there's a, just a tiny trick to it. The bentonite is a finely powdered clay, so if you pour it in all at once, it'll tend to clump up and form lumps. If you stir the water first and then pour it in, it'll dissolve really easily. Let me show you. Finally, we've got our big, beautiful bag of grape juice. We're not going to take it out because it's heavy, but I'll show you how you can pour this carefully and easily. The next step is to top the fermenter up to the six gallon mark with lukewarm water. On the Big Mouth Bubbler, it's very conveniently marked off at six gallons right there. It's important to use lukewarm water. Our instructions tell us that this should be 72 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit before the yeast goes in. If it's colder than that, it's going to slow fermentation down and the wine may not finish or clear on time. If it's a lot hotter than that, the yeast can get a little crazy and produce some strange flavors. So make sure you get it just in the right temperature range. It's also very important to go to the six gallon mark on the first day. Too low and you change the pH of the juice, too high and the wine could taste watery. So let's top it up. And 
The next step is to give the juice a really good stir. Even though it may look mixed, the juice has so much sugar in it that it can settle out in a strata in the bottom. You need to stir that into solution and get it all evenly distributed. Get in and give it a darn good stir. Don't be shy. Next, you need to take your hydrometer reading. A hydrometer is a device that measures the specific gravity or the density of a liquid. Since grape juice has sugar dissolved into it, it's denser than water, so the hydrometer will float higher in the liquid. As the yeast eats the sugars and converts them into alcohol, the hydrometer will progressively float lower and lower and lower. In this way, we can tell the progress of our fermentation by taking hydrometer readings. It's important to start out with one on the very first day. Use your wine thief like this. Dip it in and hold it under until it fills. Get your hydrometer test jar. Cover the hole in the top of the wine thief with your thumb. Pull it out straight up. Carefully put the tip into the hydrometer test jar and take your thumb off and it will fill up. I'm taking the hydrometer reading now. There's a scale that runs down the side of the hydrometer. And what you want to do is start from the 1.000 mark near the top and read down to the point where the level of the juice meets the markings. In this case, the reading goes to 1.090. Technically, winemakers often call that 1090. That's a good starting gravity. This wine will be over 12.5% alcohol when it's finished. Good reading, so let's write it down in our instructions. Once we've taken our specific gravity reading, it's important that we take a temperature reading as well. We can use the liquid in the test jar to do this. Take out your thermometer, dip it into the test jar, and leave it for a couple of minutes to let the temperature come up. We want it to be between 72 and 75 degrees Fahrenheit, before we pitch the yeast. Again, this is crucial. Don't pitch your yeast if it's too cold. And if it's too warm, you'll need to cool it down. Probably the best way to warm it up would be to put it in the warmest area of your house. If you've got a serious problem and it's 50 degrees or cooler, you can fill a bathtub with warm water and very gently send your fermenter down into it to let it warm up to temperature. If we check our reading here, we're at exactly 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Perfect. You can return the grape juice to the primary fermenter. And now it's time to add any oak that's included with the kit. This kit came with two packages. So we're gonna tear them open and pour them directly on top of the juice. Technically now it's called a must. Winemaker word for juice. Oak smells great. It's got a vanilla, toasty, woody note that's really going to complement this Cabernet Sauvignon. When you've got both packages of oak in, grab your spoon and stir it under the surface of the liquid. It won't sink on the first day. It's wood, so it floats. However, after a couple of days, it's going to get waterlogged and it's going to sink and stay in the wine. Don't worry about it. By the time you're ready to rack this from the primary fermenter into your carboy, the oak will have given up all of its flavor and the wine will have a delicious, toasty vanilla character. A lot of beer and wine making textbooks will tell you that it's very important to rehydrate dried wine making yeast before you add it. This is one of those things that's true, but not actually important in regards to wine kits. The yeast that's included with the kit is fully sufficient to ferment it well and ferment strongly just by being added dry. You don't have to rehydrate it or fiddle with it in any way. Simply tear the packet of yeast open and sprinkle it right into the carboy. This is the point where this must is now wine. As Soon as the yeast touches it, it begins to rehydrate, grow to culture strength, and then it's going to start making delicious alcohol. We're on our way. Finally, 
It's time to close up the primary fermenter and let the yeast do its work. Attach your lid to the top, screw it down, and put in the bung and airlock. And make sure that your airlock is halfway full of water. That fermentation lock is going to keep any air from getting into our primary fermenter, but it's going to allow fermentation gases like carbon dioxide to escape. Finally, put your primary fermenter into an area where it won't be disturbed for five to seven days. It's been five days since we started our primary fermentation. Now it's time to test our specific gravity to check and see if it's okay to rack from our big milk bubbler into our carboy. In preparation, I've sanitized the carboy, a fresh airlock and bung, our siphon rod and hose, our wine thief, and our hydrometer and test jar. Now let's take that sample and check it to make sure we're where we need to be. It has to be 1.010 or 1010 or less. If it's not, we can't proceed. We have to wait another couple of days, check the gravity again, and make sure it's below 1.010. It's very important. If we transfer too early, we could get foaming in the carboy uh, and it might come right out the airlock and make a big mess. So we want to wait until that gravity is the correct reading. So let's have a look. With our gravity reading at 1010 or less, we can transfer the wine from the primary to the carboy. We're going to be using an auto siphon today, which makes transferring very easy. Both of these have been sanitized and they're ready to go dip it right into the bottom and if you look there is a small tip on here. This will keep sediment from flowing into the hose and blocking it up. There's still also a little bit of oak floating around in suspension and this will help keep it out of the hose. Dip it straight into the bottom of your primary fermenter. Let it rest there. Put the hose into the receiving carboy and then with a good smooth stroke just like a bicycle pump and it goes. This will transfer everything over in just a couple of minutes. When we get to the very bottom, we're going to tilt the primary fermenter a little bit because we want to carry over all of the liquid that we can. We want to leave any visible sediment behind, but we do want to fill the carboy up with as much liquid as we can get. That's important. Ten days later, we're ready for the next step, which is stabilizing and clearing. I've checked the specific gravity and it is now 992, so it's below 1.000, which means it's completely finished fermenting. I'll take a minute to write that down, and we're good to go. Step one, we want to add our sulfite and sorbate. These are two stabilizers that are going to help keep the wine from oxidizing or spoiling during aging and storage. It's important to dissolve the sulfite and the sorbate in water first. If you add them directly to the wine, they can clump and settle out in the bottom where they won't be doing their job. So just about half a cup of water, pour them in, and give it a stir. Once it's completely dissolved, you can add it to the carboy and stir it in there. Traditionally, stirring in the carboy is done with a spoon. Since the big end of the spoon won't fit in, you sanitize and use the back end. However, the Master Vintner Series kit comes with an excellent stirring device that cuts down on labor by a big amount. This is the Clean Bottle Express Wine Degasser. It's got some whippy bits on the end that go into the wine, and the other end goes into an electric drill. With this, in only a couple of minutes, you can get a lot of degassing done. Let's talk for a minute about degassing. Without getting all the carbon dioxide from the fermentation out of this wine, the fining agents can't do their work and clear it. Also, if you don't get all the carbon dioxide out, on bottling day, the wine is going to have some fizz in it, which will give it a flat, almost metallic taste. It's really important that you follow the steps for degassing precisely. We've got our degasser inserted into the end of a drill and it's been sanitized and it's ready to go. One of the really important tips for the degasser is that you should test the wine first. 
Now this batch of wine has been sitting at 75 degrees Fahrenheit for 10 days, so it's pretty thoroughly degassed on its own. The bubbles have mostly come out. If your wine is fermented cooler, it could be quite foamy, and if you go full power with a drill right away, you could create quite a mess as it jumps out of the carboy. So let's just give it an experimental stir first to see where we're at with the carbon dioxide. That looks good. So here's the sequence for using a drill mounted degassing whip like this. What you want to do is stir in one direction at full speed for as long as you can. After a while, the wine is gonna to start to climb up the sides of the vessel and wanna come out. At that point, reverse your drill and go backwards, and that'll keep it from foaming out everywhere. Do this back and forth four or five times, and you'll have gotten most of your degassing done in under a couple of minutes. Here's how it's done. You can see how much work, how fast that gets done. It's really a labor time saver. Next step is to add our fining agent. In this case, this kit uses a product called Kytosan. So we're just gonna snip open the edge of the packet and pour it straight into the carboy. Now it's time to stir it again. All of the fining agents have been stirred in along with the stabilizers and it's been thoroughly degassed. The next step is to reattach the bung and airlock, make sure it's still half full with water, and put this back into our fermenting area for 14 days. Keep the temperature at 72 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit, and the fining agents will clear this up and get it ready for bottling day. Our wine is sat quietly in our fermenting area for 14 days, and it's ready for bottling. But there's a layer of sediment, principally yeast cells and fining agents, at the bottom of the carboy. If we bottled directly from here, we could disturb that and get some cloudy wine. What we're going to do first is rack the wine from the carboy back into our big mouth primary fermenter and being very careful, we won't disturb any of that sediment. That'll give us a free hand to get nice clear bottles of wine. Now that our wine has been transferred back into the big mouth bubbler, we're ready to start bottling. First thing we need is some bottles. You can save these yourself at home and clean them very, very thoroughly by using your one-step cleaner and a bottle brush to get all the stuff out from the inside. So after they've been cleaned, you can store them upside down in a box until you're ready to use them. At that point, you'll want to sulfite them to make sure that they're sanitary for bottling use. Alternatively, you can purchase brand new wine bottles. These don't need to be scrubbed, but you still need to sanitize them. And we're going to use our leftover metabisulfite solution to do that right now. To sanitize the bottles, we need to coat the inside with our metabisulfite solution. There are trigger sprayers and other devices out there that can do this, but you can simply use a funnel and your metabisulfite solution, and then transfer and then transfer the liquid from one bottle to the next, just like this. Repeat until you have 30 bottles ready to fill with wine. If you do it this way, there will be a tiny amount of sulfide solution left in the bottle. That's okay. We've actually already added sulfite to the wine to prevent oxidation, and this is the same stuff. And that amount in the bottle won't change the levels of sulfite in any way we can measure. However, if you're concerned, you can rinse them, but I never do. Now that our wine has been transferred over into our primary fermenter, it's clear and it's free of sediment. If you check it and you notice that it's still cloudy, don't rack it over. You can't bottle cloudy wine. It won't clear up in the bottle. You should leave it instead for another few days and check it for clarity first. But our wine cleared up gorgeously and it's ready to go. We're gonna bottle it using a siphon bottle filler. 
This is a, an acrylic plastic rod with a little needle valve on the end. And unless you're pressing up on that valve, wine won't flow. That'll let us fill our bottles neatly and accurately. I'll show you how that works in just a second. We've got our sanitized auto siphon. We'll connect up our bottle filler and we're gonna start filling our first bottle. When you hold the siphon filler deep into the bottle, the needle's pressed up and wine flows. As the bottle begins to fill, you get ready, watch it go into the neck, and stop right when it gets up to the top. As you withdraw the siphon filler, it leaves exactly the right amount of space for the cork to go into the bottle. It does drip a tiny little bit, so I've set our bottles onto a plastic garbage can lid. Now that all of our bottles are filled, it's time to put the corks in. We're going to be using an impact corker and this relies on a plunger to push the corks through a sleeve that compresses down like a funnel and sticks them into the neck of the bottle. In order to get this to work properly, the corks need to be soaked for a few minutes. I'm using our sulfite solution to do this. Then, when the cork is soaked, put it right in, get it set up, and we'll use the corker to push it in. It's much easier to insert the corks with an impact corker if you're down on the floor where you can get your weight over top of the cork in the bottle. We've got our corks soaked here in our sulfite solution. Put them into the impact corker. Pull the bottle in close where we can get our weight over top of it. Hold it down very carefully and in it goes. And that's it. In only four weeks, and with just a few hours of labor, we've got finished wine. Now that you've corked your wine, it's important to keep it upright for three days. This will allow the pressure inside the bottle to escape and equalize with the outside air, and it will also allow the cork to seat firmly inside the neck. After the three-day period, you can lay the wine down on its side for storage. When you do that, the wine will keep the end of the cork moist keeping it sealed tightly and protecting the wine from outside air. You can go a little further and finish your bottle with a beautiful label and a matching capsule over the top. Makes for great presentation. Whatever you choose to do, you're now a winemaker. Master Vintner series makes it easy, but you make it excellent. Thanks for watching. I'm Tim Vandergrift for Master Vintner. Mm -hmm.